Hi, everybody, and welcome. I think we are pretty much ready to get started here today. Uh, again, welcome to our webinar on monitoring legacy analog systems with TinyML, Edge Impulse, and Blues Wireless. So there's a lot going on in that title. So we will slowly but surely unpack it all for you today. Uh, so as the title says, we're going to look at what I consider one of the most engaging and useful use cases in the IoT, and that is regarding machine learning, specifically TinyML and how hardware and services from Edge Impulse and Blues Wireless work together and, dare I say, accelerate certain digital transformation initiatives. I know that's a very overused and loaded term, but hopefully you'll get a good sense of what we all mean by that today. First, I want to do some really quick introductions, starting with myself. My name is Rob Lauer. I'm Director of Developer Relations at Blues Wireless. With me today is TJ Van Tol, who's a Principal Developer Advocate here at Blues. I'm also super happy to have Louis Moreau here today. Louis is a senior developer relations engineer at Edge Impulse. Together, we're going to provide what I hope is a very informative and pretty engaging ML and IoT journey for you all today. Now, along with our speakers, I'm pretty excited about our agenda today. I'm going to kick things off the, with the first section with this concept of an easy button for digital transformation. Again, remember, we're scoping this webinar to effectively monitoring, analyzing legacy analog systems really without interrupting their service. So hold on to that thought for a bit. Uh, next up, Louis is going to provide an intro to Edge Impulse and what they are doing to, to kind of tackle tiny ML on constrained devices. And TJ and I are gonna briefly dive into wireless IoT and show off how Blues Wireless is tackling this problem in really new and cost-effective ways. And then TJ and I will be back to show off some uh, somewhat pragmatic uh, ways of putting some of the concepts we talk about today into action. Lastly, I want to cover some brief logistics. We will be doing some live Q&A at the end, but you don't have to wait until then to ask your questions. All three of us are here. We can answer any questions that may come up during the webinar, so enter them in the Q&A panel as they pop into your head. Uh, we're also recording this. Uh, we'll send out a link to the recording in the next day or so if you need to drop early or whatever. Uh, so I thought it's always nice for me to start with this quote. Uh, that quote is, complexity kills. It sucks the life out of developers. It makes products difficult to plan, build, and test. This quote is from Ray Ozzy. He's the Blues Wireless founder and CEO. And my hope, the reason I'm kind of relaying that quote is that my hope is that what you see in the rest of this webinar, between what Edge Impulse and Blues Wireless provide and the problems TinyML is helping to solve, I hope you really come away with this idea of simplicity how complexity kills, but countering it with simplicity can lead to really useful and engaging solutions that honestly can, de can delight developers and executives alike. Now, what of course can be a better example of simplicity than the uh, easy button? So when we talk about this concept of digital transformation, right, which we've been collectively talking about for years, we often think about tearing down and rebuilding or replacing archaic legacy systems. Sometimes it's necessary, but it's always disruptive, whether it's to people, systems, or the bottom line. So what we hope to show off today are some high-level ideas on how we can unobtrusively start to monitor, gather, and most importantly, report on way more data about existing systems than could ever have been done previously. So what do I mean by this? Well, connectivity has fundamentally altered legacy embedded systems. It used to be, of course, the types of systems that you know we built were closed, self-contained. Uh, for instance, like the machine on a shop floor it may have been a very sophisticated system with complex embedded hardware or software. But if there was a monitoring system in place, you know, it was localized. And when the machine broke, you just replaced it. So this system worked in a world of localized on-prem computing. It worked in what we considered or what we would call today like a non-connected world. Now, these closed systems were a norm previously, but with the opportunities of modern monitoring and connectivity are becoming more rare, right? Uh, but connectivity, of course, is more than just putting a Wi-Fi or cellular radio uh, on a board. In a modern system, connectivity is about insight. It's about control. It's about deriving those insights from previously unheard of sources like machine learning. It's about moving our ability to visualize and monitor anywhere, not just on the shop floor, but thousands of miles away. It's about enabling remote or a mobile control, rather, so we can take action on our systems from anywhere, anytime, and of course, leveraging the power of the cloud, cough, cough, note card and uh, edge impulse here, for the kinds of insights we could never replicate 
on the factory floor. So the kind of insight that helps us spot problems before they happen, right? So we can fix machines before they break instead of replacing them when it's too late. And while most hardware engineers are perfectly comfortable with embedded systems, microcontrollers and design, you know, they're less comfortable with this side of the equation here, right? With the web, with mobility, with the cloud and with machine learning. These are the key areas where I would say the IoT is becoming real, solving real problems. Now there's always exceptions to this rule, but for many, the IoT and ML require new skills, new hardware and new services. So at the risk of maybe getting ahead of myself a little bit here, I do wanna take one small step back and address uh, the elephant in the room, like what even is this thing called tiny ML? And maybe to answer that, I need to take one more step back and talk about what machine learning is. Uh, at a high level, ML is focused on using mathematical techniques and large scale data processing to build programs that can really find relationships between inputs and outputs, right? So to me, a great way of summarizing that is to look at it in terms of a mathematical formula like this one here. So in classical computing, an engineer presents a computer with input data, for example, the numbers four and two, as well as an algorithm for converting them into an output. So multiply X times Y to make Z. As the program runs, inputs are provided, algorithm you know, is applied and it produces some outputs, pretty straightforward. ML on the other hand, flips this on its head in a way. So it's more the process of presenting a computer with a set of inputs and outputs, and asking the computer to identify the algorithm or the model using ML terms that then translates the inputs into outputs. So often this requires a lot of different inputs to ensure the model will properly identify the correct output every time. So for example, if I feed an ML system, the numbers two and two and an output of four, it might just decide the algorithm is to always add those numbers together. But then if I provide two and four with an output of eight, the model should learn from those two examples that the correct approach would be to multiply the two provided numbers. So ML is really a paradigm shift for a lot of us, right? We're moving from writing rules in code and getting answers, which are very strict, to starting with answers, like a subset of data that builds rules for us, leading to a, uh, you know, in theory, a more flexible result. As the data changes, those rules should become easier to change. So what is tiny ML then? Well, in a nutshell, it's machine learning on highly constrained devices, right? It's constrained, or they're constrained in terms of available memory, available processing power. So they're great for off-grid, low bandwidth, low power, uh, edge computing scenarios. So there is absolutely a natural correlation here between TinyL, TinyML and the Internet of Things. You know, there's virtually endless opportunities for utilizing ML concepts, you know, to legitimately improve people's lives where they work, how they work, while optimizing for safety and efficiency, of course. And these use cases are really key because the IoT has a bit of a perception problem, right? For some people, the IoT is building internet-connected toasters that can print patterns on bread. Uh, you know, we have a reputation issue. In this industry, we've really fallen into a trap of putting Wi-Fi or cellular radios in everything and calling it done. It makes it all too easy to dismiss what we're doing as a fad. It's also why, if you're familiar with the Gartner hype cycle, why the IoT appears at the bottom of this trough of disillusionment, it's really stuck in this post-inflated expectations mode and hasn't yet found its way up to this magical plateau of productivity. But I'm here to propose that what we're talking about today, this idea of merging tiny ML with the IoT, and yes, to aid in digital transformation efforts, is absolutely key to the future of the IoT. So what's good about the IoT today? Well, we're taking these incredibly small microcontrollers that communicate with sensors or power servos or whatever they may be doing to you know, control other devices. Maybe they're generating ML inferences. You know, We're building these awesome, really small programs. They're running on highly constrained devices. They are you know, essentially great at sensing, measuring, tracking, controlling something, something physical. But the important part here is that they're also sending data to the cloud, leveraging connectivity to modernize. So for me, IoT is only going to be successful when we double down on these opportunities where connectivity enables us to do something that would be difficult, if not impossible otherwise, which is exactly what we're talking about today. So ML and IoT solutions that focus on solving real problems to move us out of that Gartner trough of disillusionment. So let's focus a little bit on the overlap of the, of the IoT and TinyML. 
this is where Edge Impulse and Blues Wireless come into play. Uh, as I've already mentioned, you know, when you start talking about ML on Edge devices, nine times out of 10, I'm just making that statistic up, you're also talking about connectivity in the same solution. Sometimes Wi-Fi can be the answer, other times LoRa, LoRaWAN, or cellular. Um, and while, you know, TinyML shines with Edge Impulse, cellular is where Blues Wireless shines with the note card. With that very, very long-winded intro, I do want to hand the mic over to Louis Moreau, who's going to give us a bit of an intro to what Edge Impulse is all about. Thanks, Rob. Uh, let me share my screen. <clears throat> I, <clears throat> I hope you can see my screen by now. So yeah, my name, is, my name is Louis, Louis Moreau, and I'm a senior developer relation engineer with Edge Impulse. Um, I actually started my career connecting rhinos in Africa when I was developing a low power solution to well, GPS tracker to put that into the rhino's horn. Um, so I was like at the beginning of IoT and doing some crazy stuff. And well, after that, uh, an old friend came, uh, the, my, my manager actually, and he told me like, well, we, with all the experience you have like building uh, IoT solution and building cloud environment things, uh, I want you in my team. So I said, okay, let, let's join. And it's been more than more than a year that, uh, that I joined Edge Impulse. And it's an incredible company where like everything is transparent and we're building tools for developers. And this is really what I like. Um, we're, we want to build uh, a tool for developers that have no knowledge in machine learning and let them collect or try to, to create their own machine learning pipeline. So what is Edge Impulse? Edge Impulse is an embedded machine learning platform um, which lets you build your custom uh, machine learning pipelines. Um, and so that you can uh, accomplish a wide variety of ML tasks such as uh, classification, uh, object detection, uh, anomaly detection, et cetera, um, or just uh, neural network cl classifiers. And we focus more on the predictive maintenance, industrial use cases, et cetera, et cetera. But we also work with a uh, with a classical uh, consumer that, uh, that that want to like just to to put some knowledge in the device. And so basically, using Edge Impulse, you can uh, collect collect data from any sensors and deploy that model to almost any devices as long as they support C or C++. And what is really important is that you maintain the control over your data and your firmware for the whole time. So we have no black box. Every single uh, block that we, that we provide uh, is open source. And you can, you can have a look at the, the, at the code. And I strongly encourage you to, to do that. So it's an online platform and we provide for each different steps, different tools uh, within the studio. So you can, uh, you can perform actions. Usually the first thing you want to do when you, when you try to create a, a machine learning model is to collect some data. And we have different tools so that you can collect either data directly from the device. You can import uh, pre-existing data sets directly into your, your studio projects. Then once you've got uh, all your data uh, that are ready, you can design your impulse. And an impulse is a mix of digital signal process, uh, DSP, digital signal processing, and machine learning blocks. This DSP, digital signal processing, is really key in TinyML because it will extract some meaningful data from the raw, uh, some meaningful feature from the raw data, and then pass that to the neural network so it will learn easily. Then we have tools to test your models uh, to make sure your, it's accurate and it will work uh, well in, uh, in, in real life. And then you can deploy, uh, you can deploy your, your model um, to, <clears throat> let's say, almost any devices, um, as long as they can support C++. We also provide ready-to-go uh, firmwares uh, for uh, officially supported dev, dev boards. So you can just test uh, directly on the device. Um, and yeah, but most of the people use the C++ library or just uh, some external components. So they can, they can build their, well, they can integrate that model to a broader system. So that was it for me. Uh, I will be available uh, for the for the Q&A. So feel free to ask me any questions. I'm also here in the chat. If you, if you have any any questions, uh, I would be more than more than happy to to answer. Thank you. Perfect. Thanks, Louis. I'm going to do the same intro, but for Blues Wireless here, really quickly. Uh, I'm going to assume you're seeing my screen. Um, so let's take a really quick look at this company, Blues Wireless. I know many of you are already familiar with Blues, uh, but for those of you who are new. 
Welcome. Uh, Blues Wireless is an IoT company that is focused on wireless connectivity. Uh, so we provide hardware and services that really try to back up this message of making wireless IoT easier for developers and more affordable for all. Um, so if this is our core mission, how do we make that happen? Well, I'd say we have three core focuses. I think focuses is the word. Um, so one is on securing data from a moment it's acquired by a sensor all the way through to landing on your cloud application of choice. Uh, also low power, all of our hardware solutions and our firmware defaults are low power out of the box to the tune of eight microamps when idle, if that means something to you. We're also very much a developer focused company and this is super important to us. Like I know it is with Edge Impulse, our developer experience is a top priority and I think you'll see that play out today to a certain extent. Looking at our hardware really quickly, the note card is the core uh, product that we provide. It is a low power system on module, measures a tiny 30 by 35 millimeters, has that M.2 edge connector at the bottom for embedding in your project. There's both cellular uh, or Wi-Fi variants of the note card. The cellular includes GPS as well, and it comes prepaid with 500 megabytes of data and 10 years of global service. And the API, the way you interact with the note card is all JSON. And we provide SDKs for popular languages here. There's also some community supported SDKs for Rust and .NET. So we have pretty good language coverage. And on the cellular side of things, we do support popular cellular protocols, again, available globally like NB-IoT and LTEM. Now to make it easier to use your note card when you're prototyping or even when you're ready to embed in a permanent solution, we provide these development boards called note carriers. So they allow you to snap a note card in excuse me, and connect it to virtually any solution you can dream up. And finally, NoteHub is the Blues Wireless cloud service that receives data as a proxy from the note card, and then in turn can securely route that data to your cloud app of choice. Uh, less important in the context of today's talk, with NoteHub you can manage fleets of devices, you can perform over the year uh, microcontroller and note card firmware updates. And again, NoteHub is all about security as well. So I mean, secure as data is transferred off the public internet via private VPN tunnels when we're talking about the cellular note card, uh, that data can optionally be encrypted as well. So great thing about using the note card with NoteHub, there's no certificate management required, there's no key rotation, the note card knows exactly where it's supposed to go as soon as it's turned on. Now again, everything is JSON in and JSON out with the note card API. For example, if you want to get your note card's GPS location, you simply call this request, card.location and it's gonna return a JSON response with the requested location. And to kind of help visualize where the note card and NoteHub sit in any given IoT solution, uh, you're gonna bring your microcontroller. One thing that makes Blues unique is that you can bring any microcontroller, any single board computer, use any sensors, use virtually any language. You're gonna compose packets of JSON data that we call notes. Those notes get saved or queued on the note card and then at a cadence you specify, they get securely synced with our cloud service NoteHub. Now we do not want your data to live on NoteHub. We want you to route that data out somewhere, preferably to some cloud app of choice, right? So that could mean AWS, Azure, Google Cloud, or some IoT optimized provider like uh, UbiDots or Losent or Datacake. You can also reverse this entire process and send data back to a note card or a fleet of note cards uh, from the cloud for you know remote control or fleet uh, variable updating scenarios. So with that, uh, I want to pass things over to TJ to do a quick uh, demo of the note card in action. Yeah, I want to show some of this stuff, just what it looks like, how it works. Because I know we have some people here that are completely new to Blues. And I think to understand some of the, the sort of fully fledged projects that we're going to be showing in a minute, it helps to see some of the hardware and the basics of how the note card works in action. So what you're seeing right now is my desk where I've got two of these note cards. I have a cellular note card and a Wi-Fi note card, and they're 30 by 35 millimeters. Hopefully you get a sense of how that big or how big that is compared to my hand. Uh, these are things that you, uh, devices that you can embed into pretty much any IoT solution through this M2 edge connector on the side there as Rob showed. And we do make a series of note carriers as well. So you can embed these in just about anything, but we provide a series of note carriers to essentially make prototyping and in some cases, even deployment easy. So the first note carrier, note carrier I'll show is our note carrier A. It's got this nice black PCB. Uh, so you'll see it has a slot for the note card to slot in. 
but it also has JST connectors um, on the side for like light bulb batteries and solar. It has these onboard cellular and GPS antennas. Uh, it's got a micro USB slot that we'll be using in a second for uh, connecting up to my laptop to show you a little bit more of how this works. So we have the A, I've got a note carrier AF over here. So similar concept for slotting in a note, a note card, but with the AF, you can also slot in a Feather compatible microcontroller. So if you have one of those and want to use that alongside the note card, the AF is perfect for that sort of thing. Uh, and I also have a note carrier Pi. I've got to grab it from the other side of my desk here and make sure I don't lose any uh, cords in the process. But the note carrier Pi is a, is a hat for the Pi that slots right on top uh, still through these stackable headers. Again, has a slot for a note card to go through. It also has this nice little slot for a Pi camera to, <laughs> to slot through as well, because I'm going to be using this here momentarily. So that's what the basic hardware looks like. You'll recall that I did mention that the all of the note carriers have this micro USB connector on the side. And that is important because as I swap back over my video and my monitor, if you'll give me just a second, do 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 to here, because the next thing you'll want to do once you make this connection. So I'm going to take my note carrier that I was just working with and connect it to my computer via USB, plug it in the correct way. And when I do so, you'll head to dev.blues. This is our hub for really everything we do at Blues, all of our tutorials, all of our guides, uh, data sheets, if you really want to dive deep uh, into our hardware. But if you're brand new to Blues, the very first thing I'd recommend do, doing once you have a note card is head to our quick start and to specifically head to our note card quick start. So this is a quick tutorial that's going to walk you through uh, the basics of how the note card works and how it communicates, how you can get data off the note card and push it up to the cloud, which I'm going to give you the quick highlights of here today. So one thing you're seeing here on the side is that you can actually connect to the note card directly through your web browser. So we use what's called the web serial API that's built into Chromium based browsers like Google Chrome, like Edge, uh, like Opera. You can actually make a connection directly to your note card and start issuing commands directly within your browser. So if I scroll down in this tutorial, you'll see that once you hook things up, the first thing that the tutorial is going to have you do is run a card.version request, which I'm going to go ahead and do, and then we'll talk about. And I'll point out a couple quick things. First of all, notice that the entire note card API is all JSON. So JSON in. So in this case, I'm saying the request I want to run is card.version. And it's also JSON out. So in this case, I'm getting a bunch of information about the note card, uh, like firmware version uh, and whatnot back from it. Now I'm running everything in the browser. And that's what I'd recommend when you're first getting started and you're doing what we're doing today, just getting familiar with your hardware, uh, seeing how things work. But I will mention that you can also do any of the actions I'm showing through the note card CLI, which we have available for Windows, for Mac OS, and for Linux. So if you're more of a CLI person, you can issue these commands there. And we also have the SDKs that we have available for you know, C, C++, Arduino, Python, CircuitPython, uh, Go, a number of platforms as well. So long term, when you're starting to, to deploy these actual solutions, chances are you're going to be running these commands and building them into some sort of script or program that you're deploying um, on one of those hardware options. And when we get into our full projects here in a minute, you'll see some of those things in action. But first, there's, there's two more commands I want to just give you the basics of, because you'll see they're sort of core to how, uh, how a note card works. And the first is for communicating with NoteHub. Now, Rob mentioned this, but one of the, the cool things about the note card is it knows how to talk to our cloud backend, note NoteHub out of the box. There's no certificate management. There's no uh, craziness that you have to do. Really, all you have to do is go to NoteHub, which is available at NoteHub.io. You will need to create an account and then to create a project. So I'm going to create one real quick just called testing, because that's sort of what we're doing here today. And when this gets built, I'm just going to grab this identifier, because the next command I need to run, if I scroll down in the tutorial bit, is this hub.set request. And with hub.set, all you need to do is pass it that identifier that you just created in NoteHub, because the note card knows how to talk to NoteHub, but it just needs to know which project to sort of associate the device with and to push data to. So I'll run that hub.set to make that association. And I also need to run a hub.sync. So the other thing about the note card, it is very low power friendly by default. 
So it tries to avoid, or I should say like minimize the number of times it's doing expensive things like making cellular connections or GPS connections. So it's not gonna take this association to this new project and push it out to the cloud until it reaches whatever interval you configure or you run a sync to tell it to explicitly uh, sync anything that's happened on this device up to NodeHub. And when I run the sync, what I should be able to do is go back here and you'll see I now have a connected device and so I've now made the association between the hardware here, the note card, and what I have up here in the cloud. Now, the last thing I wanna show is once you've made this association, chances are you want to, to do something with it. And most of your sort of IoT projects are, you're gonna to wanna to take some sort of data you're collecting. Uh, that data can be sensor data, that data can be location data, that data, should, that data could be in like the machine learning, uh, machine learning world can be like uh, inference or classification data, like what did this model show and push that data up as well. But regardless, you usually have some data you want to push up to the cloud. And the easiest way to do that in note card language is with the note.add request. So the note.add request takes a body, which is just an arbitrary JSON body. So you can put whatever in here. So again, this could be your sensor data, your location data, uh, your inference data, whatever you happen to have, and push that up, which I will go ahead and do. And then I'm going to run this hub.sync to, again, take any changes that I've made locally and push those up to the cloud. And when I do, I should see that data come through as an event. And remember, I am using a cellular note card for this, so um, it takes sometimes can take a little bit of time latency for the data to come up. Looks like it's still syncing a few things, so we can give it a second uh, to see that data pushed up. But overall, that's the workflow. You're collecting data on the note card. And again, the specific data, as you're going to see as we move into these projects here in a second, won't be hard coded. We're going to look at how to capture some actual live information. But the note card makes it really trivial to toss uh, this on just about any device, capture the data, bring it up to the cloud where you can do more interesting things with it. And we'll see if it, it came through. Yeah, there it is. So it took a little second because uh, it was syncing some stuff, but our temperature and humidity came through. So this should give you a basic background of blues. Obviously there's a lot more we could cover, but I wanted to make sure you had uh, some of the, the, the general information for understanding some of these fuller projects. I will say before I toss it back to Rob, that if you are completely new to blues and you're trying this stuff out for the first time, this quick start is what I'd recommend completing. So it's gonna walk you through the steps that I just did. It's also gonna show you how to communicate in the opposite direction as well. So if you wanna take uh, data from NoteHub and push it down to the card. Like if you want to uh, do some sort of remote control scenario where you're pushing like commands or requests uh, from some cloud down to your device, that's something you can do in the quick start can sort of show you how to do that. I'd also recommend heading to the guides and tutorials section of the docs because you can find our sensor tutorial, which is going to help you uh, take, instead of using hard-coded data, hook up some actual sensors to different boards using different languages, and figure out how to push those up to the cloud. And I'd also recommend checking out our routing tutorial because we're, we can help you then take that data from NodeHub and push it out either to just some HTTP endpoint or a number of different platforms, IoT platforms, whatever it is you have in mind and help walk you through that process as well. Because I find that once you've completed these three tutorials, you're in a pretty uh, good state uh, for completing some of these fuller projects that we're gonna be showing. Uh, but, Rob, did I did I get everything? Did I miss it? Do you think you have yeah, enough that's to uh, to go from there? Did you want to do your other demo right now, or do you need a little bit of prep time while I talk? Uh, you should do yours first, so I can okay. switch some things around, and then we can go into each of our two projects. Fair enough. Uh, well, I will do my best to share here. Um, so again, we're gonna we're gonna dive into a couple of projects that really try to use a lot utilize this concept of machine vision which is really just allowing a computer or microcontroller to, to see. Uh, so we're going to go through one project that uses machine vision to interpret analog gauges. This is what TJ will show later on. The other is using machine vision to analyze thermal images from a heating system, my home heating system, uh, to perform a type of anomaly detection. So, you know, of course, you can easily extend these into more full-fledged anomaly detection solutions or even utilize predictive maintenance. A lot of opportunities there. Um, so I have the pleasure of diving into this anomaly detection app I built that uses the note card along with Edge Impulse to analyze thermal images. Now I put, I should put air quotes around anomaly detection because what I'm really doing in this app is using image classification 
to ask my ML model, what type of image am I looking at? And if it doesn't know, I'm calling that an anomaly. Potato, potato, uh, but let's take a little closer look at this story. Uh, so this is a very personal story for me, and it starts with my home's hot water boiler system. Any of you who own or manage a system like this know they are not cheap, especially here in the States. They're one of the least common sources of home heat. Our last one ran for like 15 years before we had to pony up and replace it. Uh, and so I'm super paranoid about failures with the system. And it came to me that I could, or I'd like to somehow actively monitor this closed system, but I certainly wasn't about to open up the case and hack into the wiring and void the warranty. Now you can easily apply that, you know, on a broader scale when you talk about uh, large scale uh, machinery on a shop floor. So I built out a machine learning solution that could effectively do this for me. Now I wanted to look for anomalous behavior. For instance, there's a pressure relief valve on the upper right part of the boiler. In reality, this should never get hot as it would mean there's too much pressure in the, in the boiler and water would come out, hot water would come out. Uh, if it does, I'd really like to know about it. So looking again at my system alongside one of the first thermal images I took, you should roughly be able to see the mapping here. Now, this point is when I also learned about this concept of thermal emissivity, which some of you probably already know about, but this is the concept of the effectiveness of materials in emitting energy as thermal radiation, which is a what, what's caught by a thermal camera. Now, copper, I learned, has an incredibly low emissivity rating, which is why the pipes don't blossom much at all in the heat. But thankfully, the iron pumps do. Just an FYI, if you want to avoid the predator, I think you just need to get inside a copper box or something. Uh, but I built this project using a Raspberry Pi Zero. Uh, why? Well, it's my favorite tiny Linux single board computer. Uh, otherwise, there's no particular reason. I could have used virtually any microcontroller for this project. So truth be told, there's no strict advantage to using the Zero, other than it's super easy to work with uh, and with note card and edge impulse. Since the Zero has a 40 pin connector, like the full size Raspberry Pi, you just slot that note carrier Pi hat on it that TJ showed you. Uh, this also has a cellular note card on it. Uh, I should note this also does make the Zero a great option for these lower power edge computing scenarios. And the thermal camera, so I wired up an MLX 9640 thermal camera to the Zero. It produces a really tiny, but quite cool, no pun intended, 32 by 24 uh, resolution thermal image. And now let me get into some code and geek out a little bit here. I did write the app in Python. And my first step I knew with developing an ML model is that I needed data, a lot of data to build out an accurate ML model. So this meant taking a ton of thermal images of my boiler in action. So I wrote this Python script, which is a little bit abridged here for space. Uh, and it take, took a picture every like five or 10 minutes or so for more than 24 hours. Um, and it would snap a, a picture of the system and save it to the zeros file system. The only thing I'd point out in this code are the constants at the top there. When using a thermal camera, there's some work you have to do to identify the high and low range of the sensor temperature that you predict you're gonna get in order to get the best color range, the color variations in your images. And these are the values that happen to work best for me. So again, I ended up, uh, you know, my first step here, taking a ton of images. They were all stored on my zero in the file system. You can probably imagine. And even when I started to look through them briefly, I was very easily able to start classifying three types of images at a very high level, right? Cold, the system is off completely. Warm, it's either heating up or cooling down. And hot, meaning it's actively running and producing a lot of heat. But what about classifying anomalies? You know, any ML model I would program at this point wouldn't be able to tell me about an anomaly because it only knows what I tell it, right? So with a little help from Photoshop, I cheated a bit, kind of. I created a set of quote unquote anomalous images that would simply focus on there being hot spots where they shouldn't be, for instance, on that pressure relief valve. I'll be honest, I don't love this solution and I'm sure there's a better way to do it. But for my POC, it did work just fine and, and gave me a good start on my model, at least. And this is where the fun honestly really started for me with Edge Impulse. Now, I don't work for Edge Impulse. I'm not getting paid by Edge Impulse. But if you are looking for the easiest way to really build a variety of ML models and deploy them to all types of microcontrollers or single board computers, I can't recommend Edge Impulse enough. So I started by creating an image classification project. There's a lot of options here, depending on the specific type of model you want to create. You know, maybe it's audio based or you want to use gesture recognition. 
whatever it is, there's a path for you. Um, the next step is the data acquisition phase. So what I did was I uploaded, uploaded all of my collected thermal images. Now there's numerous ways of acquiring data within Edge Impulse Studio. I will say that the data acquisition phase, for me at least, is always the most tedious, boring, time-consuming task. However, Edge Impulse really does a great job of simplifying the process by providing some really engaging tooling options to I could classify like groups of images, for example, or even start processing them, them individually. And I believe if you're using an object detection project, I think that's what it is. Um, Edge Impulse Studio will actually learn from previously classified images and then start to, to guess and pre-classify images as you're going through them. It's really something else. I highly recommend checking it out. Anyway, setting up the rest of my model with learning blocks and identifying the four features I was looking for was a matter of click, 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 and done. Yet another nice feature for me about Edge Impulse is the fact that for idiots like me, and based on the type of model you're creating and the data you've added, like many of these values are pre-populated with defaults, best guesses, which frankly, I often end up using. You can also train your model in the cloud. And after training my model, I could see I had a pretty decent POC ready, right? In this feature explorer, you could see three different states really well uh, are pretty well identified here. But this is where I caution you in that your ML model is only as good as the data you provide. You can see here, I supplied 129 images. In reality, if I could do this again, I'd probably, I don't know, five or 10X this number. Also the anomalies I identified, they ended up mixing in too closely to the other images to be super useful, but it did work enough. Again, it's a POC, but just wanted to be completely transparent here. So at this point, I've got all these images. I've got my ML model created in Edge Impulse Studio. Since I was on Linux, I could use the Edge Impulse Linux runner to download the model file in this EIM format directly to my zero. And next up, it was time to write some code, some Python code to actually use the model on the device, which again, what I love about Edge Impulse is that I can spend way more time writing code and less on building and kind of tweaking that ML model. So again, I want to walk through another Python script here. Uh, again, a very much abridged code here for clarity. Uh, I was taking a picture every 10 minutes and then processing that image with the Edge Impulse Linux runner, which uh, was previously installed on my zero. Um, there's some great docs provided by Edge Impulse on getting started on the Pi, by the way. So this runner generates an inference, uh, an interpretation of the image that I'm sending it. Uh, again, this would either be hot, cold, warm, or anomaly. And next I wanted to save these inferences in JSON format because I'd be using the note card, of course, to relay these inferences to the cloud. And this is an example of a note, uh, which is just a JSON object representing a cold state. So in this example, 99.8% uh, chance that it's representing a cold image. Now the note card would then securely sync this data with our cloud service note hub. And we can see an example here, if you squint and look really closely of the data stored from my ML model. Now, again, we don't want that data to live on NodeHub. We want to make it really easy to route it to your cloud app of choice. And that's where NodeHub routes come into play. So routes allow you to forward your data from NodeHub to a public cloud like AWS, Azure, Google Cloud, or you can use MQTT or a custom HTTP endpoint. In my case, I created a simple route to UbiDots. Literally, all I had to do was plug in this endpoint URL and an auth token to make it work. And so I built out a very simple UbiDots dashboard. Uh, and it's really, to me, a great example of the opportunity of ML here. And that is instead of uploading all of that accumulated data to the cloud for processing, which of course can have both logistical and privacy concerns, you know, I'm creating these inferences locally and just sending to the cloud what I need. And this project got a little bit better though, because I also added an alerting system onto it with Twilio to automatically send me SMS alerts when anomalies were detected. Again, this is all just using some simple NodeHub routes. As TJ mentioned, we have some nice guides and tutorials on dev.blues.io if you're curious to know, to learn a little bit more about routing data. And if you wanna see any more about this project, I do a deeper dive on our Hackster page. Uh, you can head to this URL and check those out. We have a lot of examples of actually using uh, Edge Impulse and the no card in, in other scenarios as well. And that is my reminder to send it back to TJ. I assume you are ready to show off your little demo.
I will do it. Yep, I'm going to bring my screen back up. There we go. And I think you're going to see a lot of similarities between this project and the, Rob, and the one Rob just showed. So this is a project that originally came from our coworker, Brandon Satrum, but it's something that I've sort of forked and experimented with and made my own through different projects as well. But Brandon's original problem is around this gauge. Now, for anybody here that's worked with uh, pools before, hot tubs or any systems, uh, you might know how much of a pain that is. Well, in Brandon's case, his system that sort of cleaned out the pool was driven by this presser gauge. And specifically, if I go back to this version that has these sort of labels on it, when this gauge showed pressure between 15 and 25 PSI, that indicated that the, the pool was cleaning and operating normally as expected. Whereas if the values were too high or too low, that means some sort of manual action was required. So if it's too high, it means the, the filter needs to be backwashed. If it's too low, the filter needs to be cleaned out. Uh, but some action needs to be taken to get the thing working back as it should. Now, if you want to add some intelligence around this so that you don't have to manually go out and check this cage every day or every week or whatever cadence makes sense for, for your equipment, uh, historically, as Rob mentioned with his, his boiler system, historically, you'd have to make some sort of physical changes to that system. Uh, go in and put in a new sensor on the line somehow or put in some sort of more smart gauge on there, uh, which if you're really good at that sort of things, in some cases, it's an option. But lots of times it isn't. Uh, I'd be terrified to go in and try to modify this sort of pool system, this expensive system, afraid I'd screw something up. And it's even more true as you get into more industrial equipment. Uh, lots of times th these aren't controls that you can easily change, which makes these sort of, uh, sort of machine learning based approaches so intriguing because it gives you the ability to monitor uh, these systems without having to physically change them, which can be expensive, or in some cases, like I said, not even possible. So the steps, the, the, the sort of way I like to approach these sorts of problems, because I, as I've learned more about this approach, I've seen them coming up more and more, these sort of machine learning cases, is I, I like to think of it in terms of these steps. So first of all, you need to set up hardware. And again, as you saw from both Edge and Pulse and Blues, uh, you have lots of options here. It's really whatever hardware that you're most comfortable using. Uh, in this case, if you're working with image data, you do need some sort of camera. So uh, in Brandon's case, this was a, a Pi camera on a Raspberry Pi, but really any sort of camera device to capture image data. Uh, you need to capture data, which we'll show that in a second, in the Edge Impulse, uh, build out some sort of model, uh, get that model down to your hardware, and then take that data that you're collecting locally and transfer it up to the cloud in some way, shape, or form. And you're going to see a lot of parallels between uh, what I'm showing as I go through the steps and what Rob showed as well. So first of all, for setting up the hardware, now, when Brandon initially set this up for, for his workflow, he mounted a Pi with a Pi camera in front of the gauge, just, just sort of watch it on a tripod in a weatherproof case. Uh, my sort of hacky setup was in this thing, uh, this little container that I set outside with some actual uh, duct tape to hold the camera up, which is hacky. Uh, but as Rob sort of mentioned too, that uh, it's sort of okay when you're first doing this to not worry too much about your hardware setup. What's most important is that you get data in so that you can start experimenting and iter iterating on these solutions. Because if you come up with something that works, you can always come back and iterate on this sort of a process coming up with something a little more production ready, a little more ready for some sort of a long-term deployment. But feel free to start with something hacky just so you can get some data in. Because um, the most sort of tedious part of this entire process is getting the data that you need to drive these models. So I'm basically just going to show this in Edge Impulse real quick. So this is the project that drives this, this tank system. And you can see that Brandon's already got a number of different images in here. And there's different ways that you can connect this so you can import data into here. But you can also sample directly from devices. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start up my watcher. So this is my Raspberry Pi that I've got sitting on my desk. I've got um, a mess SSH into it. And if you run this Edge Impulse Linux command, if you install that, you can actually get a feed. So watch right here. Uh, you see me a feed from the Pi camera. Now I don't have, uh, I'm not gonna walk out to Brandon's pool right now, uh, but I do have the slides. So you're gonna give me a second to finagle this and not laugh at me as I do this. So we'll go back to this slide and, oh, I gotta get it up. Hold on a second. I can do this, right? I gotta have this on the other, uh, the monitor so we can do this. 
So this is not gonna be awkward at all. We're gonna put this over here. We're gonna take a picture. Look at how good I am at this. So we got, got our picture in. Um, this label here is also kind of important This because this is how you classify the different states of your images. So tank pressure normal, which it is, happens to be, I probably wanna, <laughs> Probably going to screw up Brandon's model, but that's okay. Uh, that is a normal pressure reading on the gauge. The challenging part, again, uh, this, this is similar to Rob's experiment as well, is you really do need a data set that encompasses all the different states that you want your model to be able to detect. So that means I might have to get this gauge pointing at all the different values, right? High values, um, which in this case, I probably could finagle, right? I maybe could turn off the system and play with the gauge and get a pretty good comprehensive data set with that needle pointing in lots of different directions so that I have a good representation of high pressure, low pressure, and whatever I need to drive this model. Um, and you can see that it took quite a bit of images. So Brandon's got like 400 in here to help, to help drive this. All right, I've got to reassemble my stuff, which hopefully won't be that hard. So we did this, we did this, we captured the data. So our next step is we want to actually build a model based on the data and deploy that model to our hardware. So this again, Rob showed this again, I think you'll find the steps to be kind of similar, which is a good thing because these are sort of repeatable steps that you can take. This is the impulse design screen and edge impulse where you can do this sort of thing. Now, like Rob, I am also a very much a machine learning novice. So I also appreciate that the defaults here in edge impulse are actually quite good. So when I've built things with this before, usually I just take the defaults and get started with that. And that usually gives me most of what I need. And then I can refer to the docs or uh, ping smart people like Louie if I need help to further sort of fine tune these processes um, and get them like I need. But overall, this is how you create your model. And you can deploy either through the CLI. Rob actually showed, I, I didn't realize you could deploy models directly through the Edge Impulse CLI. So I learned something new. Uh, or you can use their UI here in the deployment section to actually deploy this. So if I go then, next step is to go to our actual source code. So this is the code that runs this sort of gauge detector. And I'm not gonna walk through every line of this Python file. I'll give you a link to the full source code and the, the full project right up after this. So if you do want to, to replicate this or take this in its entirety, you're welcome to do so. I'm just gonna point out a few quick things. So first of all, I do have to load up that model. I'll make this one size bigger too. I'm gonna load up that model file. And if I scroll down a little bit here, the main sort of loop that drives this, I'm gonna take the model fire and set it up as an edge impulse runner. I'm gonna get some, this is just some code to get a, an image from the camera, from the Pi camera. And then I'm gonna run that image through the edge impulse classifier. So the classifier is going to take that image and classify it into those different labels that we set up. And specifically, if I go in, you can actually look this, if you go into like model testing, and I pick one of these images at random. It's kind of cool that you can classify this straight through here. So I have an image, the resolution is bad, but this is pointing at like 22, 23. And you can see the classifications here. In this case, the, the model was very confident that this was tank pressure normal. Uh, it, it's actually positive that it's <laughs> tank pressure normal. Uh, and if it were other ones, you would see it reflected in these classifications. So those are the values that come back. Um, in how you sort of classify to know which, I guess, which like mode you think the, the gauge is in or what classification this image came back with. Which takes us to the final step in our process is just because you have that data, uh, usually you want to do something with it, which is where the note card comes in really, really handy. And so the other thing I'll point out in this file is if I scroll back up, you're gonna see some of the commands that we saw earlier when I gave the basic intro to the note card. So there's a little code that uses our Python SDK to initialize the note card so that we're able to communicate with it. If I go down, you'll see the hub.set command. So that was the next command we ran to associate our, our actual note card, physical note card with a note hub backend. And then if I scroll down, you'll see I am also note.adding the classification results. So I'm pushing those results up to note hub. And if I go into the note hub project and I got to switch back to the pool tank, da, da, da. this one, and go into the events. You'll see that this classification data comes in. <laughs> and actually, it's 97% uh, sure that the tank pressure is too high. So we're going to have to talk to Brandon a little bit after this about his, his pool situation. So it's pushing that data up to Node Hub. 
And then finally, the, the last piece of the puzzle here is there's another note that add request that happens here that's conditional. So if the state, the classification that came back from the image is either low or high, there's a separate note that's going to be take that's going to be sent out with this tank alert. And this actually acts as the trigger in NoteHub to send out an alert. So you'll see actually because the tank pressure is high, an alert went through here. And we have a route set up so that specifically when that type of alert or if that type of note file comes through, they will send that SMS through Twilio. And if you do find that information, so there's an example of the, the text that came through. And if you found any of this stuff interesting, or if you want to try to replicate this yourself, if you head to bit.ly slash ml dash pool tank, you can find the full write-up on this, Brandon's full write-up that has details on the project. Um, it's got the full Python source code. It also has links to our Twilio docs. So if you do want to set up alerts that are uh, Twilio-based SMS alerts, uh, there are full instructions on how to do that there as well. So check that out. And hopefully you saw like through the steps that, uh, at least to me, what's exciting about this is the more I use this, the more I like just run across things in my day-to-day -day life. It's like, oh, hey, that would be a really cool thing to set up, spin up a basic model, uh, put it out in the field, get some results, send it up to the cloud. Uh, there's lots of interesting things you can do once your brain starts to see problems through this lens. And that was it, Rob. Awesome. Did I, did I get Thank it all? You. Yeah, it was perfect. Um, I always try and pride myself on ending webinars uh, before the allotted time. So I'm going to get right to, the, right to the ending here so we can jump in for a little bit of Q&A. Uh, just really quick notes before we jump into the Q&A. Uh, both Blues and Edge Impulse have their own previews you can use. Uh, so if you head to dev.blues.io uh, for the Blues, you can look at all of our technical resources. Edge Impulse has this awesome evaluation uh, or walkthrough rather at studio.edgeimpulse.com slash evaluate. Um, also, just for attending, we welcome you uh, all if you're curious about Blues Wireless to use that URL or scan that, URL, scan that QR code to take 15% uh, off a uh, starter kit. And again, like if you want to look at more of these projects uh, in more detail, check out the Hackster, check out Hackster uh, IO, and you can find all kinds of uh, Edge Impulse and Note Card projects. So with that, um, I know we got a lot of chat questions. If you have any other questions, please put them in the Q and A panel, and we're, we'll try and get to those in the next five minutes or so. Let me see if I can try and moderate some kind of Q and A. I know one one interesting point was brought up about like how we use the Raspberry Pi for both of these projects. And I totally confess that I think I tend to default to the Pi platform. And I think I mentioned this because it's so easy. And I, it's like, and it even though it's easy, I can use Python, it's really comfortable. It's not super realistic for a lot of um, edge computing scenarios because it is a bit of a power hog, even the zero itself. And so it just tells me that like, and this is just a reminder for TJ and I, like going forward, I think we need to work a little bit more on constrained microcontrollers with our projects. So just putting that disclaimer out there. Uh, but actually, Louis, do you want to talk about FOMO a little bit? Because that was a pretty interesting new feature you guys released. Yeah, sure. With pleasure. Um, so yeah, I've, I've seen some questions on, <clears throat> on how to run object detection on microcontrollers. And we very recently, like a month and a half ago, released a, a new model called FOMO, which stands for Faster Objects, More Objects. And it actually performs really well on microcontrollers, like if on Cortex M7. I think you can achieve something like uh, 30, 30 frames per second. Um, like if you've got the Arduino Nikla Vision or even the Arduino Portenta Pro or the OpenMV Cam. And yeah, that's astonishing fast. Um, and how does it work exactly? So instead of uh, training, so we still use uh, tr some transfer, transfer learning um, techniques, but instead of uh, extracting bonding boxes using SSDs, uh, which stands for a single shot detection, we actually train on, um, on centroids and we cut one image into subgrids and we classify each of those subgrids uh, independently. So you can get the location of the image, well, the location of your objects in the image. What you won't be able to get is the size of the object because you won't get the bonding box, but you will get just a, a dot uh, where your object is. And this is um, this has been developed by our by our uh, ML experts, and 
yeah, it's a brand new technique, and uh, yeah, I, I strongly encourage to test it if you if you're interested in in object detection on concerned devices. Cool. Yeah, huh? I'll say too, just as a quick note, that the object detection stuff is a lot of fun to play with. So that the Rob and I were mostly showing classification, but object detection is essentially just find an object in an image. And I, I played with it to just teach, teach it to detect certain of my kids' stuffed animals just as a fun project, which they had a blast doing too. And it's just, it's fun times. So I'm going to say, if you're looking for a fun like weekend project, uh, you can entertain yourself with that pretty well. Uh, there's a really good question from Pratik uh, who talks about uh, is it possible to possible to address anomalies in real time? And I think, yeah, that's like kind of the whole point of what we wanted to talk about today is, you know, we showed you two kind of somewhat silly, uh, but hopefully slightly pragmatic examples here. But ideally, and you can think of a scenario where, uh, you know, like for for the, uh, the the gauge monitoring project, where if the gauge was measured to be in the high zone, it, we're simply talking about application logic at that point where you in theory, you engage some kind of filter process from there. Um, so it, it's like, yeah, you can you can start, you know, we're, we're focused more on just the reporting aspect, but you can take this full circle and, and really dive in pretty deep with creating these inferences and actually taking action on that data automatically instead of just, just alerting. Um, so there's a lot in the chat I'm trying to look through, and I know we answered some of these initially. Louis or TJ, if anything stands out to you, I know, oh, sorry, one more thing. There's a question from Greg about changing note card motion settings, like from the note hub API to note hub to the note card. So basically, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a good question. So I did talk about this bi-directional nature of the note card, how you can send data and effectively receive data from note hub as well. I don't have a good answer for Greg's question because he's talking about changing a specific setting on the note card through the API. Um, I'm pretty sure we don't have an API for that yet. We do have this concept of um, environment variables that are kind of like cloud variables that get synced with a device. So you have the capability today to set any kind of custom variables you want that you're uh, that you can use to to download from NodeHub and then use within your application logic to make any settings you want, setting changes you want. If that makes sense, uh, we do have some docs on this, but I don't want to dive into it right now. Um, any other big questions that either of you saw? Yeah, someone was asking if the Edge Impulse models are run in the cloud, but I believe the, uh, the, all the inference and such happens locally on the device, which is kind of the, the cool part of it. it. So it can happen super fast and offline and everything. Yeah, correct. And that's, that's the value of it because you can, you can actually treat the the problem locally, or like send send a send a report or send 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 the anomalies. Um, but if well, you you could run that in the cloud. But the, the whole value of tiny ML and not not it's not just edge impulse is the ability to run the models directly onto the device. Ah, uh, cool. A question from uh, Nalini came in about the note card providing a means for the host to offload application processing. Uh, no, right now. So the STM32 chip on the note card is not available for end user usage. Um, certainly something we've heard about before. So so stay tuned. Uh, maybe we'll have something for you at some point. And a question about what the difference is between the Swan, Feather, and ESP32. So the Swan, I mentioned it in the chat, I believe. Swan is a microcontroller that we, uh, we build and, and provide. We actually have a great uh, Edge Impulse tutorial with the Swan. Um, it is, it is, it does use the Adafruit Feather. It's sorry, it's Adafruit Feather compatible, so it has the same uh, pin uh, configuration as the Adafruit Feathers. Um, it does use an STM32 L4 chip, so pretty low power but pretty powerful at the same time uh, chipset. So that's different from the ESP32, which is a, a totally different uh, chip from a company, different company, and. All right. I think we're at the top of the hour. It's probably a good time to cut it off. Uh, thank you again. Thanks, Louis. Thanks, TJ. Thanks, everyone, for attending. And again, you'll get a, a list of a set of resources and a recording here in about a day or so. Thanks a lot. All right. Yeah, Goodbye. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye. -bye.